Well, good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, thank you for continuing to join us for our June 15th, first day of our June National Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting. Our next panel for the day is titled Clinician Care, Post-Pandemic Immunization Insights. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Academy of Medicine found that burnout had reached crisis levels among U.S. healthcare workforce, with 35 to 54 percent of nurses and physicians and 45 to 60 percent of medical students and residents reporting symptoms of burnout. Multiple stressors have negatively affected clinicians who give vaccines. For example, vaccinators are ex experiencing a new level of hostility and mistrust. Moral injury and administrative burden are also being cited as impacting clinician health and productivity. In this session, we'll learn more about this. Our speakers for this session include Dr. David Sattler from Western Washington University, Dr. Marie Brown from the American Medical Association, Sean Martin from the American Academy of Family Physicians, Dr. Todd Wolin from Shots Heard Around the World, and Dr. Wendy Dean from Moral Injury of Healthcare. And we will start with uh, Dr. Sattler. Uh, Dr. Sattler, are you on? Good afternoon. How is the audio? Uh, audio is good. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is David Sattler, and I'm a professor of psychology at Western Washington University. My colleagues and I conduct research worldwide examining mental health subsequent to community-wide stressors and stigma. It's an honor and pleasure to participate in today's panel. Next slide, please. I would like to begin by expressing appreciation and gratitude for your efforts to protect the American people and for your dedication to the well-being of healthcare workers throughout our country. We are especially grateful to healthcare workers in the medical community for their steadfast commitment to providing high-quality healthcare to the American people. And a special note of thanks to Ann Aiken, Rebecca Lazaration, Bob Hopkins, and staff for arranging, arranging this panel today and to the other panelists for their contributions. Next slide, please. We've witnessed unwavering and timeless acts of kindness and compassion during the pandemic, yet stigma has been present, and healthcare professionals, people who tested positive for COVID-19, Asian Americans and others, have been subject to maltreatment. For example, at a pharmacy in the United States, an Asian woman was attacked when a customer covered her in disinfectant spray and yelled that she was the infection. Although others observed the incident, no one came to help her. The lack of response from observers, their silence and indifference was as troubling as the violent act itself. Next slide, please. Stigma involves labeling, stereotyping, and discrediting. And a key aspect is the perception that individuals with a given characteristic present a threat or have been rejected by others. COVID-19 stigma can result in part from a lack of knowledge about the virus, including how it spreads and ways to prevent exposure, fear, which can develop when one may not have accurate and transparent information about the virus and protection methods, and the tendency to increase distance from those who are perceived to be a threat and to view them as an other. Mental, medical and public health organizations have called for swift measures to address COVID-19 related stigma, discrimination, and violence, yet much work remains. Next slide, please. Stigma developed during a period of unprecedented threat and stress due to the virus, a time characterized by uncertainty and losing a sense of control, predictability, safety, and trust when we were all in an unfamiliar situation, navigating the threat of illness or death, enduring job loss and economic hardship, and not having full access to our social support networks, our family, friends and neighbors. It is with this context that I ask you to consider how stigma developed and influenced interactions with healthcare workers. Next slide, please. To shed light on COVID-19 stigma and address the paucity of research examining societal responding to incidents of COVID-19 related hostility, my colleagues James Johnson, Kali Otten and I examined how economic hardship experienced during the pandemic might influence how people perceive a COVID-19 related assault. We sought to understand whether perceptions and judgments about the incident would vary 
depending on whether the individuals in the altercation were white or Chinese, given statements about the origins of the virus. The results show that when the victim of the attack was Chinese, participants who were experiencing a high degree of COVID-19 economic hardship were less likely to endorse financially compensating the victim, and they were less likely to support legal consequences for the assailant compared to when the victim was white. These relationships were mediated by reduced recognition that the victim suffered emotional trauma and pain as a result of the attack. Next slide, please. In another study, my colleagues and I examined the relationship between COVID-19 stigma and psychological distress, including the degree to which stigma, stigma experienced during the pandemic might be a contributing factor to post-traumatic stress symptoms, which can develop after exposure to psychological trauma, such as a life threat. We found that experiencing COVID-19 stigma, behavior change in response to COVID-19 stigma, feeling excluded, among other variables, were associated with post-traumatic stress symptoms. What's more, together, the variables explain 90% of the variance in post-traumatic stress symptoms. Other studies report additional adverse outcomes in response to stigma, including anxiety, depression, and worsening of pre-existing mental health conditions. Importantly, my colleagues and I also note that stigma was associated with intent to receive the COVID-19 vaccination. Being vaccinated may carry with it the perception that the person is less of a threat. However, research is needed to show how this perception may have evolved during the course of the pandemic. Next slide, please. As a result of COVID-19 stigma, healthcare workers have been subjected to acts that threaten their personal safety. There are unnerving reports of individuals purposely spitting on, coughing at, and verbally and physically assaulting healthcare workers. Due to their increased risk of COVID-19 exposure at work, healthcare workers have reported being harassed and bullied. Taylor and colleagues note that some members of the general public believe that, quote, healthcare workers should not be allowed to go out in public, should be isolated from the community, and due to their occupational exposure, they may be viewed as a potential source of the very infection that the community is trying to prevent, unquote. Here's a statement from one healthcare worker summarizing their experience, quote, I'm scared that someone is just going to hit me from behind if I'm wearing my scrubs emotionally. It's still there in my head, and I don't know how long it's going to take for me to recover, unquote. As healthcare workers are navigating this burden of stigma, in addition to challenging work conditions, including long hours and irregular shifts, staffing shortages, physically and emotionally demanding work, seeing suffering and desk, death and risk of exposure to disease. To address stigma, Dye and colleagues highlight the importance of clearly presenting information from reliable and official sources to increase awareness, but not fear or uncertainty. I would also note that focus groups with representatives from the audience for whom the information is intended and consulting with behavioral scientists in developing and testing messaging can provide useful feedback to refine information and increase message effectiveness. Research is also needed to examine other contributions toward healthcare worker stigma, especially as recommendations regarding preventive measures have evolved. Next slide, please. For healthcare workers, many studies show another manifestation of stigma. In this form, stigma can act as a barrier to seeking mental health services. Here, we have a statement from an emergency room physician who writes, they quote, have seen a therapist and have been on antidepressants. Our system considers this a red flag instead of a positive signal that I'm taking care of myself, unquote. In a cross-sectional study of healthcare workers in the U.S. during the pandemic, Van Wert and colleagues found that approximately 14% reported depression, 43% anxiety, 31% sleep disturbances, 22% post-traumatic stress symptoms, 46% emotional exhaustion, and 23% lower resilience. Mental health issues were associated with health fears, job stressors, perceived stigma, social stigma, and avoidance, workplace safety concerns, and with taking care of COVID-19 patients. There is need for further work addressing the utility and efficacy of occupational mental health interventions for healthcare workers with a special focus on stigma 
that acts as a barrier to treatment. Next slide, please. Pandemic-related hardship and trauma has the potential to lead to some positive outcomes, such as post-traumatic growth, a process wherein people reflect on what gives their life meaning and what they value, and to reconsider their life priorities. In another study examining stigma during the pandemic, my student co-authors and I show that the anticipation that one may be the recipient of stigma, as well as behavior change due to COVID-19 stigma, were associated with post-traumatic growth. Reestablishing feelings of safety, stability, and control may be necessary prerequisites to exploring meaning-making and purpose subsequent to trauma. This is a central message today. Helping people maintain or reestablish feelings of control, predictability, safety, and trust. For healthcare workers, three levels of support, individual, team, and community, are especially vital, as Crystal and colleagues at Yale note. Further work is needed to examine the efficacy and utility of occupational mental health interventions for our esteemed healthcare workers. Next slide, please. In closing, as we debrief experiences and decision-making during the pandemic and look forward, careful reflection regarding factors that influence the development of stigma, ways to mitigate it, ways to provide timely and accurate information to and support the American people and healthcare workers is essential. The behavioral and social sciences, including social psychology, organizational psychology, management, clinical psychology, and sociology, would be welcome partners in addressing stigma, burnout, and organizational functioning in healthcare settings. Thank you again for your dedication and commitment to improving the lives of our healthcare workers and our fellow Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sattler. Our next presenter is Dr. Marie Brown from the American Medical Association. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Admiral Levine, Dr. Hopkins, and the committee for inviting me to discuss this very important issue. As mentioned by Dr. Hopkins, the National Academy of Medicine in their Sentinel report entitled Taking Action Against Clinician Burnout, a Systems Approach to Professional Well-Being, really raised the alarm and asked for call to action. And I commend the uh, organizers of this meeting uh, that you took the time to have a panel um, and, and uh, appreciate the my co-panelists to join on this very important topic. Given the association of burnout with quality of care, turnover, reductions in work effort, outcomes, vaccine rates, these have profound implications for the U.S. healthcare system. I've been asked to share statistics pre and post pandemic and focus on the effect on vaccine impact. But most importantly, I'll provide a roadmap for solutions organizational system solutions, not looking at the personal resilience. We've been measuring clinician burnout for years. And as mentioned, U.S. nurses have experienced burnout before COVID, anywhere from 35 to 45 percent. And in national studies, U.S. physician rates, 40 to 54 percent. During the pandemic, given the fact that clinicians were highly motivated, are highly motivated, and guided by values and called to this wonderful profession, burnout actually decreased, as you can see here in this study by Shanafelt and Sinsky. Many ambulatory clinics closed for a time, and providers were her heralded as heroes. But with the politicization of masking and vaccinations, burnout rose to an all-time high. However, the good news, as demonstrated by another report, the RAND report looking at burnout, the principal driver of clinician satisfaction is delivering quality patient care. And that is wonderful news. And that remains wonderful news. Receiving useful quality performance data and practice leaders' responsiveness to physicians' quality improvement suggestions were predictors of greater professional satisfaction. 
And that re remains true. So when a clinician is able to deliver quality care without being distracted by other unnecessary tasks, we see that patient satisfaction, vaccine rates, outcomes, full-time effort, and trust, most importantly, as we heard in the last session before lunch, trust increases. But when clinicians experience burnout, it's because obstacles interfere with their calling. And all these other attributes increase and head in the wrong direction. So how does one recognize the symptoms of burnout? Well, we know it's a long-term stress reaction that includes emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a feeling of decreased satisfaction in our profession, all our hard work. But what does it look like? These are some of the thoughts that many, if not most, healthcare providers had when they were uh, seeing patients. Oh, don't get vaccinated, but don't call me when you get sick. Right. I can't take this anymore. Depersonalization, another science skeptic. Or referring to a patient in a non-human, compassionate, empathetic way. Oh no, another diabetic train wreck in room two. Right. And that feeling of decreased personal achievement can manifest similarly. I'm doing, spending half my day, and the research shows, almost half the day doing unnecessary tasks that do not provide quality to the patient, to the provider, or the system. It's easier to just check the box that says patients declined. So we know that while burnout might manifest in individuals, it absolutely originates in the system, and it's the system and our organizations that have the ability to change and must change. The NAM report recognized this, as did the follow-up perspective by Sinsky et al., entitled Organizational, Evidence-Based, and Promising Practices for Improving Clinician Well-Being. Organizational changes. And that's what we at the AMA and many of the other organizations in the House of Medicine is focusing on. This paper endorses solutions focused on reducing job demands, improving resources and workflows, and to start by removing the unnecessary tasks with very practical examples. The evidence is very clear that half the physician's workday, especially in healthcare workers' workday, can be, in, in, can be distracted from our patient doing a tremendous amount of mostly EHR burden work or implementing guidelines that have been overinterpreted. So we know that one of the main drivers of burnout is the EHR tasks, the great transfer of work when EHRs came into being. Many of the tasks done by many of the other members of the team were transferred to the healthcare provider, the nurses, and the doctors. Research is very clear. This was an elegant study done uh, by Sinsky et al. at Dartmouth Hitchcock, Hitchcock, a time motion study that showed for every one hour of face-to-face -face time, three 20-minute visits, two hours of documentation time. And we know many of our healthcare workers are bringing two hours of work home, or many going part-time or leaving practice altogether. This is not sustainable. The, the data here has been replicated in the American Family uh, Practice, uh, an, uh, American Annals of Family Medicine as well, looking at almost a 12-hour workday, six hours spent on the EHR. Now, these studies were published prior to the pandemic, and what happened during the past pandemic? Well, we know that patient messages alone increased by 57%. All of this computer work distracts the healthcare provider from having the time to care and develop trust 
We heard this before lunch. Trust is key to improving those outcomes, improving our vaccine rates, improving our adherence to the wonderful treatments that we have. And we also know during the pandemic, and this was true long before the pandemic, that the number one, and we saw this data earlier today as well, the number one trusted individual is their own health care worker, their team, their nurses, or their doctor. And this was uh, published in 20 uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. So surveys have shown this consistently throughout history that patients put their greatest trust in their own personal health care provider. But trust takes time. It takes a tremendous amount of time to develop. And the pressures on our health care workers throughout the country, which preceded the pandemic but have persisted, take us away from developing that relationship. So many of us went into medicine, we would say, well, what do you want aspire to? Do you want to be trusted or respected? Many would say, oh, I want to be respected. You're respected if you show competence. But you have to be able to have the time to show that you care. And that is only built on time. Because only when you show that you care for the patient and show that you're competent will you have the trust so that the patient will follow your recommendations. But where are we going to find that time? And that is the work that we are doing all across the country and that I help with at the American Medical Association. In the past 10 years, we have developed a toolkit at StepsForward.org, which is open access, no need to be a member, no email even required, with 70 toolkits, many written by people here in this room, authors from all over the country with best practices. These are actionable toolkits that you can take to help deliver greater care and save time so that we can get back to doing what we were called to do, which is develop that relationship with our patients. Here's an example of a, uh, we've compiled many of them into a saving time playbook. Again, easily accessible and open access. This is the content, and you can see there's three parts. And the first part is stop doing unnecessary work, right? Unintended, but burdensome. So that we think that about research shows as many as three hours a day is spent doing work that is unnecessary and does not provide quality to the patient, the provider, or the organization. We've developed a toolkit get called Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff. And for my pediatric colleagues, I've been corrected and said we want to call that uh, Getting Rid of Waste. We don't want to use the word stupid. Dr. Melinda Ashton wrote about this in a wonderful piece in the New England Journal and authored this toolkit so that you can go back to your organizations and find out what your teams are doing that is unnecessary and wasteful that can be removed. And when people have done that, in as simple as one week, they've been able to remove billions of clicks. Billions of clicks just because we begin to see what we're doing that is unnecessary. We've highlighted many of these in a two-pager called the de-implementation checklist. Ask your teams what they are doing that is unnecessary, they know. Help them remove them. But this is a system problem, this is an organization problem, and it can be done. If you do just, if you are able to do some of this, you can save hours each day, which adds up to maybe weeks or even doubling your workforce. Because if you're wasting half the day and we remove those unnecessary tasks, we have in essence doubled our task force. So, to end, my take-home points are trust is critical to overcome vaccine hesitancy, to improve the outcomes for all the wonderful treatments that we have, but it absolutely takes time to build. We're not talking today just about COVID, we're talking about Tdap and RSV. But as an internist practicing for 30 years, we're also talking about taking their diuretic for blood pressure and their statin to prevent heart disease. Right? 
So I just want to remind you that the principal driver of clinician satisfaction is delivering quality patient care. Let's make sure that we remove any and all obstacles so that our wonderful healthcare workers can back to what they were called to do and deliver quality patient care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Our next presenter is Sean Martin from the American Academy of Family Physicians. Well, Dr. Hopkins, um, Anne, and the committee, thank you so much for inviting me. I, um, I chose not to use slides because I'm going to just share some information that really is going to build off of what the other speakers have spoken to and just really try to put a finer point on what I would um, kind of call those administrative burdens that are impacting um, the delivery of vaccines or the vaccinations in the country, particularly in the context of, of um, the primary care community-based setting. So Dr. Brown just concluded, started and concluded her remarks with kind of the focus of, of physicians in the country, which is really a commitment or a calling to a commitment to deliver patient care. Um, and then they meet a reality um, of a complex healthcare system um, that makes that very, very challenging on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to accomplish. So family medicine, primary care, just like other practices, um, can be complex. Uh, it's also time limited. Um, they have a very uh, limited amount of time to accomplish as much as possible to uh, achieve or facilitate health amongst the patients that they are caring for in the context of their personal choices and uh, health objectives. So I'm going to jump through three things that I think are the leading drivers of administrative burdens. Uh, Dr. Brown just spoke to some of them. I'm going to use a little more um, um, simpler terms to describe them and um, then talk a little bit about how that applies to vaccines. So I think, first of all, um, there is a, a desire amongst physicians in the healthcare setting, in the practice setting, uh, to reestablish or regain clinical autonomy. Um, and that's not clinical autonomy outside of the aspects of guidelines or guidance um, or evidence. It's clinical autonomy in what happens with respect to the day-to-day -day patient encounter um, and how they go about achieving uh, that uh, patient achieving um, health. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as checklist or other types of things, but a restoration of clinical autonomy um, is greatly sought. Um, in all aspects of the practice of medicine. Um, the second one is really removing unnecessary barriers to care. And, and this, a lot of this is in benefit design and payment design, um, timing, the ability to do certain things inside an office visit and outside an office visit. Um, we know in family medicine that oftentimes uh, vaccination is a secondary um, event. Um, it's not really the reason that the patient in front of them came to the clinic that day or to see them. It's a secondary event. Have you had this vaccine? Have you not? Um, and the barriers that we put in place to administer vaccinations and quality health care in the moment um, are, are far too great. Um, and then the third thing is, is what we refer to inside my organization as the complication of the routine. Um, so we make routine things really complicated in health care, particularly in community-based primary care. And most of us have experienced this. Uh, just as patients, but certainly those of you that uh, engage in direct patient care uh, in a clinical setting understand how complicated just routine health care um, has become. So let me talk a little bit about three administrative burdens that I think are really impacting um, our ability to vaccinate the population um, in a consistent uh, manner. First is the uh, um, lack of credibility in our information infrastructure. So the flow of information from practice settings um, really becomes a, a hindrance and a burden at the point of care, understanding what vaccine, vaccinations have been administered, what have not, uh, really kind of tracking information across various systems um, to make a decision. Um, the lack of information is hindering decision making um, at the point of care. It's hard to believe in 2023 that we can't uh, transmit uh, portable health information in a more consistent and rapid manner, but that continues to be a problem. The further you get away from large, de you know, centralized entities, the more and more complicated that becomes. The second thing is the reporting and documentation. There's an, there's an uneven application of reporting and documentation related to vaccinations. 
from various settings and clinicians. Um, there are certain uh, aspects of uh, documentation put on physicians for the purposes of payment that aren't applicable to others uh, in the uh, healthcare marketplace. I'm not saying whether the documentation is right or wrong. Um, in my day job, I get paid to say it's wrong, but for the context of this conversation, it's just the inconsistent application of this makes it more complicated um, uh, across the healthcare system to provide vaccinations to all populations. And then the third thing um, I do think is important to think about, especially in a post-COVID world, which is inventory management. Um, in community-based primary care practices, inventory management of vaccinations becomes critical. I would say it's one of the leading reasons why they do not administer vaccines in a lot of practices because they just don't have a mechanism to control their inventory. It's hard to get. Our supply and distribution channels are largely cascading from the largest entities to the smallest entities. So again, as you move away from centralized care settings, it's harder. The acquisition becomes harder. Um, the quantity becomes harder. They need smaller quantities. It's hard to, sometimes to buy smaller quantities. Uh, and to the credit of this committee and, and the government and suppliers, you know, it is amazing. We do have single dose vials for a lot of vaccines now. And, um, you know, that uh, is a tremendous advancement um, in the ability of small community-based practices to really uh, provide vaccinations in, in the care setting. Um, I, I think inventory management, um, I would characterize as probably the most uh, important issue that we could address to drive higher vaccination rates, particularly in decentralized primary care practices. Um, it, it's, it's just very, very difficult to navigate the distribution channels um, and then for them to get quantities and supplies that are appropriate for uh, the panel, if, if you will. So um, I know that's not the most exciting presentation you're going to get today, but I just kind of wanted to give you three things to kind of think about as you think about the, the true administration um, burdens that physicians are facing uh, to achieve the goals that we all really want to see, which is a well-vaccinated, healthy uh, population. And I thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to represent the country's 130,000 family physicians uh, here today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sean. Our next presenter is Dr. Todd Wolin from Shots Heard Around the World. Thank you very much, and I am uh, honored to be presenting here. So first off, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. So I'm a general pediatrician for over 27 years, board certified lactation consultant for 25 years, got involved in sleep medicine, and a really passionate vaccination advocate. I've seen kids die from vaccine preventable disease, which should be becoming less and less likely, but unfortunately we're seeing that go in a very different direction. In my work with vaccines, I have done a lot of work uh, in clinical vaccine research for 14 years. But in the past six years, my work has really revolved more around vaccine communication and vaccine confidence. Now, I'd like to be a little bit provocative in saying that safe and effective vaccines don't work when people don't trust them. We have hundreds of billions of dollars going into research and development, but how much do we put into addressing the problems that everybody keeps bringing up? We kind of know the problems. We know the antidote, trust. We know disinformation is a big part of this right now. And yet, how much are we putting in to that very problem and that obvious solution? I'd say a really unfortunately small and not a substantial enough amount. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, I eventually became the CEO of our practice called Kids Plus Pediatrics. Uh, Kids Plus is in Pittsburgh. We have about 110 employees, about 20 providers. And we happen to have this space called Evidence-Based Studios because we know the value of communication. And so we podcast and we create videos and we use social media. Uh, as a matter of fact, our full-time communications director repeatedly says, if you aren't here, you aren't relevant. It's not just Gen Z and Gen Y that are here. Xers are here, boomers are here. And if you can't, in 2023, 
get your information when you want it, where you want it, and how you want it, then you are irrelevant to them. Uh, there are laws against patient abandonment, and yet we abandon them. And there's absolutely somebody that's going to fill the space and give them answers if we're not here. So I used to say, you know, it's really important to have a good website, and you should consider social media. But in 2023, you need to have a social media presence because that's exactly where people are, whether it's a mom breastfeeding her child at 2 in the morning on a couch or, frankly, somebody in a bathroom. That's where they're getting their information, and we all know it because we do it. And yet we can't get our heads around this. Every other business sector collectively puts hundreds of billions of dollars into social media use because they realize a positive ROI, return on investment. For every dollar spent, they get more than a dollar back. So they can get you to buy a $12 double pump mocha latte or get you to buy their car or go on their cruises. And yet we can't figure out the largest sector in the economy to use social media to get ROI, our ROI which is better health outcomes. So the story goes like this. In 2017, the CDC says one of the top five priorities is to get HPV vaccination rates up. Because in 2017, we had a really awesome vaccine that had been out for 11 years with really crappy rates. And so our practice said, huh, because we knew the data, and as you've heard it now said multiple times, that trust of your local health care provider can change the game. It's really kind of the antidote. And so we created a 90-second PSA called We Prevent Cancer. And we used each of our providers in 90 seconds to dispel myths. We actually stole it from the NFL domestic abuse campaign, where they had NFL players saying, no more, he's just drunk. No more, he has a bad temper. Except we said, it only takes one touch. It only takes one time. And we use the word intimate touch because it doesn't require intercourse to spread this. We were dispelling this. And within... Within three weeks, we have 15,000 views and people calling us up because they're trusted local uh, health care providers like Olivia there, who is a physician assistant, saying, oh, that's Olivia, my physician assistant. People calling us up, setting up their appointments. The only downside was we were pretty good at this message. And so one of the mother-in-law, one of the mother's sister-in-laws in our practice, because she put it on her Facebook page, look how cool my group is, this is a great video, except her sister-in-law was an anti-vaxxer and dropped it into a 40,000-strong group. Whereupon, the video went viral, which is awesome, um, but then we became the target of one of the first large-scale, global-coordinated anti-vaccine attacks that launched over 10,000 attacks onto our Facebook page from over 800 accounts, uh, multiple of those posting over 100 times per day, which kind of stunk. Um, but... I'll tell you a little bit more about the story. Uh, the anti-vaccine industry thrives on social media because the algorithms prize sensational, fantastical, and oftentimes frequently disinformation. The more fantastical, the bigger it blows up. And these social media companies make billions in revenue because it's called clickbait. We can't help ourselves as humans. We are designed to detect threat, which is why your uncle and your aunt and your grandma are sending you these stories all the time because it scares the bejesus out of them. Um, and unfortunately, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act protects these platforms because they say, we aren't in control of the content, we're just a platform. I do think we should address that, but that's not my talk today. My talk is the second issue, which is if you decide to stand up and speak up, which I think you should, as a healthcare provider who is trusted at a local level in 2023, if your message resonates, you will be attacked because you are a threat to the anti-vaccine industry. And so as a result, you saw what happened to us. We were harassed, we were threatened, and in terms of reputation, we were harmed. Our aggregate score on Google went from 4.8 down to less than a star, um, as it did on other rating platforms, including Yelp. Though Yelp fixed it in two weeks, Google took 344 days. Um, so yeah. So we knew being a victim was pretty terrible. Uh, we sure as heck knew we weren't going to be the last. Uh, we knew better resources were necessary immediately. Um, and we also knew, we, we, we were on the cover of the LA Times, on the cover of the New York Times, Science Times, we've been in three documentaries. We had a call from a nine-person communications team at a health center, which I can't name, who was calling to reach out to our communications director, who was on the cover with me uh, on that article, asking our, for our communication director's advice because the CEO and CFO of this billion-dollar health system went silent heading into flu season 
on vaccines because they gave them direct orders, don't post anything about vaccines. And we tracked them like August, September, October, and they did not post. They are not just scared of bad press gaming scores. They are scared of a potential social media attack. And this is a very small group of people controlling an immense amount of power. And so as a result, what they want you to do when your message resonates and they attack you is to take the post down. But we didn't. As I like to say, they attacked the wrong practice. So um, we launched a fork pronged counter response with research. And we've been published um, in four peer reviewed journals in the last three years on this. Uh, we created an anti anti vax toolkit, which has now been translated into Spanish, French, and Portuguese. We created a digital cavalry, taking a book out of the anti vax uh, book. By the way, all the people that were attacking us were global. Not one was from Western Pennsylvania. These weren't our patients attacking us. This is a sophisticated network that's job is to shut you down. Um, and so we took a page out of their book, vetted thousands of people that were pro-vaccine around the world, and now if you were getting attacked in real time, you could contact us. We'd like the signal fires of Gondor, and the pro-vaccine riders of Rohan would come to your aid in real time. Um, and we also launched an awareness campaign. This is what it's like to be attacked, and I can tell you we, we felt all of these things. You feel overwhelmed and isolated. The, the intent is to frighten and weaken you, and behind the anonymity of the Internet, it's scary to be called these names and to be threatened. Um, and again, the reputation harm is real. If your practice goes from 4.8 stars to less than a star, I would equate this to if you want to go get tacos tonight, you probably go onto your phone, on Yelp, and if you see a one-star taco stand a half block that way and a 4.8-star taco stand that way, I bet you don't say, well, let's see if those are fraudulent reviews on there. You probably just go to the 4.8 taco stand. So there's real damaging power created by these platforms that allow their review systems to be weaponized. Yelp has got their stuff together. Google, I've been told to continue to shame them. I'm shaming you. Um, so as a result, we created a counter response. And after three years of work, we launched a nonprofit called Shots Heard around the world at shotsheard.org, which um, basically did all the things that you see there to counteract the effects of being attacked if you go online to advocate for vaccines. Unfortunately, our nonprofit came live in March of 2020 when this virus that's going around now kind of came out, which made um, it hard uh, to continue on our own. The great news is we started working with another larger nonprofit called the Public Good Projects, which we handed the nonprofit over to, which I remain a volunteer senior advisor to that, to that group. Now, you've heard it again and again and again. Trust is incredibly powerful, and it's, it is the antidote to disinformation. Year upon year, if you look at surveys, nurses are the most trusted profession. Physicians aren't far behind, but if you break it up, by specialty pediatricians are right up there with nurses, followed by Sith Lord and then member of Congress. Um, uh, I take that joke from uh, Mark Del Monte from the AAP. I, I will give credit where credit's due. Um, the point is, though, we possess a huge amount of trust. The problem is, again, that we don't utilize it. Because if people don't hear us, how does it even matter? The other thing is that trust does not exist at the level of the system or the insurer. It's not Kaiser and Mayo, even though they carry some trust. It's, hey, that's Joe, my nurse practitioner, or that's Dr. Laura. That's where the trust exists. And we have to have our voices amplified. We can only see 20 to 30 patients in a day, and with burnout, it's pretty darn hard. I can see hundreds of thousands of people. Though my goal is not to be big in New Zealand, it's just to be big around my area where people see me, whether it's at the grocery store, in the office, in a house of worship. So it's not the system level. Um, you guys know this data, right? As much money as we want to put into health care, that's not where the greatest impact is. Social determinants of health and environmental health is about 20%, genetics 30 behavior 40%. If you think about it, at the root of what we do, particularly in primary care, is we are behavior change experts, or hopefully we are behavior change experts. Now, I told you, every other sector in the economy uses social media to change behavior, and yet we still can't wrap our heads around this. And you might say, how can we even affect uh, genetics? Well, if you believe in epigenetics, if we can change behavior and social determinants, we can even impact genetics. But we have to build upon that trusted longitudinal relationship. And I see families for 20 years. I'm seeing kids of kids now. My senior partner is seeing kids of kids of kids. And you know, all we have to do is say, I would do it. And they'd be like, OK, good enough. Um, but we have to reach people. Again, you can't scale up seeing people in the office. You have to use tools like this. 
Uh, and again, you can change behavior and you can improve quality. As a matter of fact, I now talk and give talks on social media as the ability to change population health, heat measures, all the things we're measured on. That is really where the key is in the special sauce. But we aren't trained to do that. Uh, I feel kind of like Nostradamus when I see this, which is in 2019, I was saying that I was trained to fight viruses, bacteria, and malignancies, when in fact, who, did, who knew the biggest threat would come from insurance, politics, and pseudoscience? 2019. We are not being adequately prepared as attendings, as residents, as medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, public health officials, public health students, name it. We aren't being adequately prepared, even though you keep hearing the same evidence, and even though we know what the problem is. So this is what we're fighting. And I would tell you that the anti-vaccine industry is amazingly good at using narrative. If you remember Jenny McCarthy coming out and saying, I, I, the light went out in my child's eyes when he was given the hepatitis C vaccine. And yes, that wasn't the right, right vaccine that she was saying, but it didn't matter because she had a compelling story. Why aren't we using the real story where, in fact, the anti-vaccine industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, and yet they take no oath to do no harm, and they don't deal with the consequences. So the three Ps are, right, don't use vaccines, but use my oils or use my crystals, or vote for me and I'll keep government out of your house or school board or, or school district. And finally, the ability just to con con control narrative and get power from it. So unfortunately, in 2023 and beyond, that makes healthcare professionals, scientists and researchers targets. If you choose to be an advocate online, which I am recommending, and is everybody going to do it? No, but I think at least at the level of the group, every group needs to have representation to show their providers on there. And if you are good enough to get your message to resonate, you will be attacked, which stinks, but we need to be prepared for that as well. And there are some residencies that are dabbling in this just now. Um, look, I do a lot of work with the AAP at the national level too. Child, the, the health of children and families in general should be a bipartisan issue. But sadly, in the last four-year cycle, it has not stayed that way. And I watched Peter Hotez and Paul Offit present at the national conference showing the death rate based on political affiliation, which was disparate for the first time. And that's sad, but it's a truth. And we are targeted, and I can tell you, people would come into our office when we had the signs up about masks, or if we would talk about vaccines, and immediately sensing that we were likely to be attacked. And I now, when I, I give lectures, I ask, have you been harassed or attacked? I would have never asked that prior to this whole sequence of the last couple of years. But in fact, that is now the situation. Um, and, and what you see here is the same thing. Attitudes towards school vaccines, particularly measles, mumps, rubella, is now dropping, uh, particularly broken by party affiliation. Uh, lastly, I would like to point this out to this report that came out of the Public Good News, which is an arm of uh, the Public Good Projects, which now shows, and this report came out in April of 2023, showing that the U.S. is now the main source of vaccine disinformation, and we now export it globally, and that there are several healthcare providers that use social media in nefarious ways. I could get a million followers today if I said, oh yeah, government's in bed with pharma as it is, you know, we're making money and there's snake venom in, the, in, in vaccines. All lies, but I could blow up today, and I could make money off of that. And that's what we see happening. Now, one way to control that is to have licensing boards of nursing licenses and medical licenses to hold their own accountable. But if you're looking at certain states now, they're neutering licensing boards so that they can't hold their own accountable. Um, finally, my call to action is we have trust. We have the ability to impact people, but we need to change training in terms of health communication and using all sorts of media. It should start at the school level, it should go through residencies or whatever the path is for pharmacists, nurse, and everybody else, all the way through attendingship. Um, and we need to continue to be supported. Right now, if you, you know, the graduating physicians and healthcare providers are completely comfortable with social media. It's just when they sign their contract with their health system, they say, don't get us in trouble by using social media. So they're like, I'm not touching that. So we don't empower them. And with that, I would say thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolland. Our next presenter is Dr. Wendy Dean from Moral Injury of Healthcare. Thank you so much. I'm going to say that's a really hard act to follow, <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to try. Um, so I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation and for RPI for all the logistics that made it so easy to get in here. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about moral injury. We've heard a lot about trust just now, about how our patients trust us or don't. What I haven't heard is about who do the clinicians trust. And I think we need to start thinking, flipping the script a little bit and thinking about the position of our clinicians as we go forward, especially coming out of COVID. So you've heard um, Dr. Brown did a great job telling us about the usual burdens that clinicians face. So I won't, I won't review that very much except to say that every clinician I talk to has this same litany of challenges that they face. But as I talk more to them and I get deeply curious, I've said to them, so are you burned out? And early on in the work that I do now in moral injury, they would say, you know, I love my patients and I love the medicine I practice. But what I can't, what's really getting in the way is everything between me and my patient, all of the administrative burden. And Isabella Rodriguez, who is a, I'm using a pseudonym for a clinician in Western North Carolina, said to me, I was in education and training for 25 years. To learn what the gold standard of care is, the second I walked out into practice, I had to compromise that care. I knew I was signing up for long hours. I knew I was signing up to see impossibly hard things. What I didn't know was how hard it was going to be to get my patients the care they need. And that reflects what Todd was talking about in, you know, I knew that I was going to be fighting disease. I didn't know that I was going to be fighting um, this business machinery of medicine. And I wasn't prepared for that. And she said, and that's what breaks my heart. So what she was saying is, I don't have the language for what I'm facing. I didn't either when I was first talking to her. And after doing this, um, you know, curious uh, talking to thousands of physicians, I started saying, you know, there's, it, it feels like this is a fundamental challenge. There's something that is threatening the very core of who they feel like as physicians. This isn't just about being tired. It's not just about feeling like they're doing meaningless work. It's something different. And I heard about this concept called moral injury. I was working for the Army at the time. And it was, it was first developed by Jonathan Shea, who was working with Vietnam veterans. And he said he was treating them for PTSD, and they weren't getting better. And he said, hang on, good clinician that he was, he said, maybe if we're treating patients for something that we think they have and they're not getting better with treatments that we know work, maybe we need to reconsider the diagnosis. And so he started thinking about this concept of a more of a soul wound. And what he said was that moral injury was betrayal by a legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. And he was talking about orders to go in and clear a house, to kill women and children. We don't do that in medicine. But we do have, we do have other, cha other challenges in high-stakes situations. A couple of decades later, um, Brett Litz and his colleagues expanded the concept. And what I, think they, what I think we talk about here is that when you sense a betrayal, there's a moment where you can stand up and push back or you can acquiesce and transgress your deeply held um, beliefs and expectations. In medicine, in healthcare, those deeply held beliefs and expectations are the oaths that we took, whether implicit or explicit, to put our patients first when we first entered into this profession. When we acquiesce and transgress that oath, we increase our risk for moral injury. So my colleague Simon Talbot and I put out this thought experiment, figuring that it was going to go into the bin with all the other, you know, into the pile, into the folders with all the other um, burnout, distress literature. 
And in fact, it went viral. 300,000 people downloaded it. It went from healthcare to veterinary care to public defenders. Like, a lot of people resonated with this. It wasn't because we were so smart. It was because people needed new language. They needed a new way to talk about what they were experiencing. And just to put a point on it, this didn't happen, didn't start before, it didn't start with COVID. February 24th, 2020, I was shoulder to shoulder, unmasked, with a lot of people <laughs> in a council room in New York City Hall, testifying about safety in New York City emergency rooms and the need to address moral injury. None of us were masked. Three weeks later, the city shut down. So they were thinking about this beforehand. When the pandemic hit, what I heard over and over and over again was what Ed Yong um, captured in this quote. Healthcare workers aren't quitting because they can't handle their jobs. They can't handle being unable to do their jobs. They have constraints left and right. The pandemic stress tested our healthcare systems and pointed out the gaps and vulnerabilities that we have. It showed our healthcare workers at their very best. They came together, they did what needed to be done. But it wasn't because of, it was in, in many places in spite of what they were working in. And what they were saying was, I don't know if I can continue being a doctor. This is not what I signed up to do. It's not what I thought I was signing up for. To be constrained by the constructs outside of my influence from doing what I know is right for my patients. And so we've heard a lot. We've, we heard from Dr. Statler some, or Sattler, some of the um, quotes already from clinicians. I was bombarded in the first 18 months of the pandemic. You know, um, it's like walking in Chernobyl without any gear. The whole place was lava. Um, hospitals didn't take care of us. They were expressing betrayal on multiple levels. They were saying, I showed up, I, I, I said, whatever you need, and they cut my retirement benefits, and they furloughed my staff, and we're not getting raises while our executives get bonuses. They said, um, as soon as it looked like we weren't gonna have enough PPE, we relaxed the safety standards. Who's taking care of me? Who is looking out for me? I thought those standards were there for me, to protect me. And the media polarized what was happening with vaccinations, with um, the virus as a whole, and it led to the abuse that you've already heard about. And lastly, for our patients. You know, we heard the comment already that um, patients didn't want to take a vaccination, but they came to us for rescue. And in the process, often delivered a lot of abuse. Clinicians are feeling beleaguered on all sides. So this is some of the work that, I've, that my organization has been doing with George Washington University, the IHI, and the American Federation of Teachers um, as part of a HRSA award. And what we did is our charge was to develop a national framework for burnout and resilience in healthcare workers and public safety um, workers. What we did is to take the six different <laughs> reports that have come out in the last year addressing clinician distress and put them all together. Um, I know this is really hard to see, so um, you might want to just go to the website if you want to take a closer look, wpchange.org. I think it's posted, and if it's not, it will be soon. Um, but the, the bottom line from it that's different from all of the other reports that have come out is to talk about this concept of moral injury in conjunction with burnout. We're getting very clear data that these are two separate entities that often run together, but not always. They can influence each other, um, and they require different solutions. So 
We absolutely need to address burnout. We need to address the administrative burden. We need to make systems run smoother, but we also need to address the betrayal and relational rupture that our healthcare workforce is feeling. Without doing both, we aren't going to get very far. So I do still want us, you know, as we shift to thinking about solutions, I do want us to have patients at the center, but not at the, it's not at the expense of clinicians. Because patients know when their clinicians don't trust their systems, don't feel supported, are distressed, patients feel it, their satisfaction scores go way down, and they don't follow our recommendations, whether it's for vaccination or it's for our blood pressure medications or whatever it is. So we need to take care of our clinicians so they can take care of better, they can take better care of our patients. We need to rebuild our communities. And this means across licensing groups, and it also means across the imaginary divide between administrators and clinicians. Clinicians adhere to, they're trying to keep patients alive. Administrators are trying to keep their organizations alive. We need both. But we need them to talk to each other, and we need them to reconcile the differences in their goals so that we're all working in the same direction. And as I said, we've talked a lot about building, rebuilding trust with patients, but we must rebuild trust with our clinicians. It is at a state that I haven't seen in seven years. I mean, as a psychiatrist, <laughs> When I, when I would see patients, I would ask, you know, every psychiatrist, every visit has to say, have you had any thoughts about suicide? And if a patient says yes, your next question is, have you made plans? Because that's a, that's a real, that's a real um, fork. If your patient has made plans, their likelihood of following through is much higher. What I started hearing from clinicians about halfway through the pandemic was no longer the fantasy of, oh, maybe when I retire, I'll get a horse farm or I'll open a bakery. It was, I have made plans. I know exactly the date when I can walk away. I have, <laughs> I have applied for a Chick-fil-A franchise. I have written a business plan for my bakery. They're making plans. And if we don't do something about their trust in their systems, we won't have anybody to deliver vaccines. One of the things that we need to do is to look at what makes a morally centered organization. This is from um, a research project that we just finished, asking more than four dozen um, experts in moral injury across the world, what does it look like to have an organization that is at low risk of creating moral injury? They are wise, they learn from their mistakes, they're human and vulnerable, they are trustworthy, they do what they're going, what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it, to their clinicians, not just to patients, not just to their communities. They mentor. They succession plan for the next generation. They train people up to take their leadership roles. They don't just put them in it and hope for the best. They're just and they're courageous. When they get feedback from their clinicians, no matter how hard it is, they listen and they act on it. But at the same time, they also push back. They push back on regulators. They push, push back on legislators. They push back on insurers who are asking for unreasonable things. We need more courage. So just in summary, what I would say is we can't move this. Any one group can't move this alone. We have to start working together. And we have to promise each other that we're going to do that together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dean, and I want to thank all the members of this panel. Uh, are there any questions or comments from uh, members of the committee here in the room or online? Chris Harrisman. 
Thank you for those presentations. They were, um, well, they seemed right on and a little disturbing. And I just wanted to add the comment that I think that we're looking at the clinical, our clinical systems and the impact that um, those providers are feeling. But I also want to acknowledge that I think I saw this in public health as well. And so I think our public health professionals are experiencing the same sense of um, fatigue and moral injury. So um, we, we can't be successful without each other. And so I think it's just important to acknowledge that our, our, the extent of our system that is hurting is, is pretty broad. But thank you for, for sharing this, because I think it's incredibly important. He's on. OK. Um, I just want to add that absolutely, yes, I've seen that in pu the public health um, workers. Also, we did a study of um, executives and leadership, and 40% of them experienced moral injury during the pandemic as well. So it's a point of, it's a point of commonality and a point uh, to start change. And um, just trying to look up Dr. Shelley Fiscus, <clears throat> who you may know uh, was run out of Tennessee <laughs> for promoting evidence-based information. And I think in her multiple interviews has pointed out, I think it's like 30 states um, directors of health departments have kind of left and including a multitude of people at multiple levels in, in um, public health for that very reason. You know, and I'm putting back my clinician hat on all of this, I think one of the other challenges that I see in this spectrum of burnout, moral injury, all of these things, is language. You know, those of us that trained uh, in the previous century and started practice in the previous century appreciate and think about burnout, moral injury, and response very differently than those that are coming out of training in the last 10 years and coming out of training now. And I think it's important that we create that commonality of language as well as a commonality of expectations and collaborative approach to fixing problems. You know, recognizing what's the small stuff that we can attack first. What are the things that are going to take longer and more resource intensive efforts? And what are the long term issues that, you know, you can't get frustrated because that's not going to get fixed tomorrow because it's not going to get fixed tomorrow or you're going to have to do something else. do not have any more comments or questions uh, uh, online or in the room. I want to thank you all. I think you've challenged this all, uh, and uh, we are going to be mulling this uh, as well as working on at least the small stuff from the start. Todd, please. If I can say one more statement about medical education. If I told any physician and I said, uh, headache, diaphoresis, palpitations, and I threw up the word hypertension, Everybody in that room pretty much raises their hand and says, pheochromocytoma, uh, a neuroendocrine tumor with an incidence of two to eight per million. You'll never see it. But we're trained and asked on every board. But we're not trained to deal with the kind of things that we're hearing here. So we need a change. And it's like pulling teeth to change the traditional medical education system. So, But there is hope. We do all know to ask, do you have a plan? <laughs> Thank you all for your, for your presentations. Very helpful. All right, our next uh, presentation is uh, from our Innovation and Immunization Subcommittee. Uh, our co-chairs of this effort are Dr. Jewel Mullen, who is on the line, and Dr. Bob Swanson, who's in the room. Uh, they have, uh, they're going to give us an update on the subcommittee. Act on the sub They're going to give us an update on the subcommittee activities and uh, some discussion questions to hear from the committee on aspects related to fulfilling the charge. Bob here in the room and Jewel online, thank you both. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about all the, the work that we've been doing in the subcommittee. Um, so I think I'm going to have trouble reading that. I'm going to use my phone. Thanks. So, um, first of all, um, 
as co-chair, Dr. Mullen has been the co-chair with me, and, and uh, I will say that she brings such a, a great calming to that group and uh, brings it together, and it's great having her as a co-chair, um, along with um, Ann, who helps us tremendously with uh, what we're, we're working on. We have NVAC members, um, Bob Hopkins, Dan Hoff, and Molly Howell, who are on the committee as well. And um, then uh, NVAC ex officio, Robert Johnson, and then several public uh, members that we have who truly are experts in the field that bring a knowledge base well beyond what I could represent, but um, do a great job with this committee. So just a little on the charge overview. Um, NVAC uh, should write a report that includes, and I will say this is a very aggressive um, uh, charge that we have in front of us. First of all, a review of public, conventional, and promising novel approaches for vaccine discovery and development. A set of recommendations for actionable high impact activities an evidence-based approach for identifying and prioritizing vaccine candidates and immunization technologies, including their criteria for prioritization. NVAC should take the potential impact on disease burden, population health outcomes, health equity, economic impact, national health priorities, and scientific feasibility into account in the development of this approach. A list of vaccination innovation priorities include target antigens, molecular platforms, and immunization delivery technologies. Um, a forward-looking approach to introduce vaccines for special patient populations and neglected diseases to portray their value and importance. And a scientific agenda outlining a framework of research direction and identifies scientific needs and gaps that should be addressed by the end of 2028. So you can see we have quite a, a, a large uh, look ahead of us. So talking about some of the activities that we've been involved with so far, we've hosted several different speakers on priorities for vaccine innovation, uh, vaccine development, uh, ecosystem using pertussis as an example, uh, state plans to reduce immunization exemptions in schools, vaccines to prevent antimicrobial resistant infections, vaccine development innovations using rotavirus as an example, uh, reviewed disease burden data. We've engaged in thoughtful discussions around charge elements, and I will say those discussions uh, get very deep and lengthy, but um, very, very insightful. So our next steps. Uh, planned presentations on influenza case study for on equity and demand. Uh, develop a report outline, which uh, we're starting to work on. We're going to work to determine top pathogens leading to the highest disease burden in the United States. And I'm not changing my slides, am I? I apologize. Um, determine top pathogens leading to the highest disease burden in the United States. Assess status of vaccines against each priority pathogen with regard to pipeline and marketing status and adequacy. Uh, identify gaps in public health need versus available and, and development stage vaccines. And make recommendations regarding how to close gaps by focusing on funding innovations and technology platforms. So with that, we have a few questions for discussions. Uh, but uh, before that, Dr. Mullen, anything you'd like to add to what I presented so far? Um, thanks. Actually, no, the only thing that I, I hope people understand from everything you've described is the discipline it's taking for us to stop thinking about what else we should consider. Because we know at some point, we really need to narrow in, but we're thinking about prioritizing at the same time that we're not quite sure what the future has to hold, and we never, um, will never let go of priority populations and what their needs are. So as you hear these questions, please, I mean, please help us with your answers because they may guide us to where we go next in some of our um, upcoming discussions. I think, I think, thank you for representing us so well.
Ah. Sure. So with that, my phone goes dead. Um, so the first question for discussion, uh, advancing immunization equity, which we'd love to hear some input in. NVAC recently approved a report to advance immunization equity. Many of the new technology strategies and vaccine development approaches could be very helpful in improving health equity. This is true for developing new and improved vaccines and could be more accessible to, to people, novel administration techniques that increase vaccine demand from new, uh, from new people, as well as improving health equity by pre preventing diseases that unequal, unequally affect certain groups of people. Please share your thoughts about ways we should apply the lens of equity to fulfilling this charge, and I'd love to hear input on that. Any thoughts? Bob, just one thing I would mention is if people don't have direct answers here now, please uh, send those to Ann or to either of our committee chairs, uh, and those will be shared also, both of the subcommittee as well as with the rest of the members of the committee. Be great. Good. Um, so let me move to the next one, unless, yes. Chris, please. Uh, thank you, Chris Ayersman. Um I guess one thing I'm wondering is, have you considered um, asking to hear from various populations that are underrepresented or that need, um, yeah, additional encouragement for vaccination. I'm just thinking that, um, just looking at our group here, the ones that are present, we're, we're not particularly diverse. And so just wondering if we can make sure that we're hearing from the communities themselves to see if they have um, suggestions for us and how we can be more effective. So, Chris, so far we've talked a lot about equity, but we haven't had presentations from different groups that uh, are underserved potentially, so I think that's a really good idea. Anything, Dr. Mullen? Okay. It's always a, a wonderful question. We have um, taken different perspectives on, you know, the approach to equity as we've thought both about groups that experience the highest burden or, or disease states that have the worst population impact, which might also then take you to among which groups. So there are many different ways of thinking about that and then moving us to you know, our charge, which really gets to how to innovate around that, which in part also may be innovate, innovating in the way in which we recommend prioritizing vaccines for development or different modalities. Um, and so, so I appreciate the, the question and the recommendation because it also takes us back to a lot of this morning's conversation around um, vaccine confidence and trust. Thank you. And I think it might also be worth looking back. We've had some speakers on those areas in the diversity area in our last couple of NVAC meetings uh, that may give us some uh, some fruitful presenters on this topic. Agree very much, yes. I'm going to move to the next question for discussion. Um, challenges to improving existing vaccines. Uh, Iteratively, improving existing vaccines or developing new vaccines to replace existing vaccines because we can present economic and regulatory challenges. As many improvements are required to demonstrate both improved efficacy and reduced risk of adverse events compared to existing vaccines. The risk can uh, financially disincentivize vaccine manufacturers from developing improved vaccines. Um, what are NVAC's thoughts about the public health impact on financial disincentives in general? And uh, how would the subcommittee explore various challenges in improving existing vaccines? Any thoughts? Again, just going back to a presentation at one of our prior meetings, thinking about some of the, the presentations that were made about uh, some efforts to improve polio vaccines. Yeah and some of the regulatory challenges. And I think we've also had a number of discussions around potentially improving the efficacy of our pertussis vaccination program without going to the point of the uh, more severe reactogenicity that we had with first-generation vaccines. Sure. 
I think we've also had discussions about flu vaccine too and that efficacy. So yeah, thanks. Okay. And again, um, uh, any comments can be sent in as well. So there are thoughts. Hey, Bob. Yes. Industry has to put up such a large financial start to get these vaccines started, looking at uh, going back to the basic science and then advancing it into stage one, two, and three clinical trials in that big of an investment. Speaking, have you engaged um, the industry as far as what, what are their roadblocks or what are they running into possibly other than the financial burden that might prevent them from advancing some of these vaccines that need some help? This is one thing I was thinking. So I think many of the members that are on the committee are from industry. And so they have voiced um, a lot of things that um, they could use in support um, to continue to develop vaccines, such as streamlining the process or even the, uh, I'm trying to remember the language used um, in the development of vaccines and, and uh, the research needed to go into that development in different products. So there has been quite a bit of discussion about that. I don't know if it's been specific to every hurdle that they face, but uh, many of them have been talked about. That, that actually is, uh, has been part of the reason for the case studies we've done around uh, both inf influenza coming up as well as TDAP previously. Uh, Bob Schechter has a question or comment online, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob and Jewel, for all, and the subcommittee for all the work. Um, going back to the equity question, I, I just struck with um, the tension between uh, innovation and trust and the issues of trust and to what degree as, as with Operation Warp Speed, where, where what, what, what can we learn that uh, will convey confidence in the existing science around that innovation to uh, a concerned or skeptical or worried population? Jewel, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Yes, we wonder about that too. We talked about it. And I think, you know, your point is a, a reminder that we have to continue to talk about um, science or advances um, health protection all the time and, and help demystify this notion that if something sounds new or innovative, it's experimental and hence about to be used to experiment on someone. Um, and so that's, I think that's part of the work that we all have to do. And so we've talked about that a bit some as well. And, um, I think we all hope that people will not want to use language like warp speed anymore in the future as, as part of you know, helping people stay with us in those conversations. Thank you. I have one last discussion question just for your, your thoughts. Um, alternate immunization strategies. NBAC has heard presentations on monoclonal antibodies as a passive immunization therapy for RSV. Uh, subcommittee members discussed strategies for targeting high priority pathogens and protecting immunocompromised very young populations and pregnant people. Another example potentially includes immunotherapies such as cytokines or, uh, are being worked on. Um, what are your thoughts about new strategies like uh, monoclonal antibodies and immunotherapies to support immunization efforts? Any thoughts? And again, you can think about these. Well, this just my thought here is that I think the way that I approach the idea of immunization in 2023 is very different from what it was in 2013 or in the previous century. You know, we think traditionally about active immunization for infectious disease targets. But with some of the successes that we've had on passive immunization, monoclonal antibodies during the COVID pandemic, some of the efforts being made uh, and 
successes in monoclonal antibodies and long-acting monoclonals around RSV. I think passive immunization has to be a part of our uh, discovery process and our disease prevention efforts going forward. And we also have to recognize that immunization or immunotherapeutics are going to be a potential area of growth uh, in the next decades going forward, potentially for infectious diseases, but also for cancer and a number of other things. So I think as we think about immunization for the betterment of health of our societies worldwide, we have to think beyond just active immunization for infectious disease targets. It's my bias. Good point. Thank you. Chris, please. Chris Ayersman. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just reading the slide and realizing that um, obviously the intent was to get our thoughts, but I'm realizing that we probably need to change our language as well to acknowledge that the bulk of our efforts have been focused on active immunizations using particular modalities and that what we're really trying to do is, you know, think more broadly because um, you're right, this monoclonal antibodies would be passive immunization. It's still immunization. It still fits in our, um, in our realm, but we need to make sure that we acknowledge that what we've talked about historically and, and most frequently is active immunization using certain, um, you know, biologic. So I, I just, I'm realizing that it's, it's sort of educating not only ourselves, but um, the populations that we work with and our partners that really we're not, we're not suggesting something that's outside the purview of NVAC or it's, it's not too broad. It's just understanding the, the focus that we've had historically and that perhaps we need now to expand that a little. It really does expand our, our area. Yeah. Molly Hell. Yeah, and I think I would weave some equity into this. Uh, a lot of the new modalities are more expensive than traditional vaccines, and so uh, we have the Vaccines for Children program for kids uh, and li very limited vaccines available for uninsured adults. And as some of these new modalities are becoming more routine, how are we going to ensure that populations who don't have insurance or as great of access are, are still able to get what they need in terms of whether it's a monoclonal antibody or other therapies? I also think we need to think around the, the infrastructure around some of them. Like, will immunization information systems be needed to track some of these, and how will they do that? How will billing work? Um, Right now we have the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. How will we track safety, uh, kind of some of the infrastructure that may have to go into some of the new um, modalities that are coming forward? I think both, both really good points. And I think about when I was the program manager and how the impact even on legislation that regulates what we can take into a immunization registry and whether that's even possible in some states. So, yeah. Thank you and add another permutation of potential new delivery systems beyond just the injection into the sure. arm. Yeah. Please, Chris. Chris Ertzman. Um Yeah, I think, I, think that, I think it's important to think more broadly and to consider these new modalities and what role you know, they can play in improving health, just like active vaccination or active immunizations have, have had in the past. But I do think that, you know, Molly made excellent points, and it's, it's huge and it's complicated. So it's, it's something that needs to be thought about, but it's not like, oh, yeah, let's do this, and next week. I mean, it, it would completely impact all of the existing structures, so there would need to be a, a reevaluation of the current systems in place. That doesn't mean necessarily that there shouldn't be, but just um, I realize I don't want to sound too cavalier, like, you know, don't bother to count the cost because there would be a huge cost. But I think my thought related to that would be I hope they build on the infrastructure that's already in place and not try to rebuild something new for it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. Don't reinvent the wheel when you have a pretty nice wheel right now. Yeah. And, and I guess, again, from, from my perspective, some of these things may be beyond 
the scope of what we're able to do in this one report and may require some things potentially being placed in a parking lot or a this may mean to be further fleshed out going forward in the next iteration of this effort. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. And Dr. Mellon, Mellon thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're staying right on time. We've reached uh, 2.45 uh, Eastern time, time for a break. Uh, we'll let people rest their brains and uh, stand up and stretch a bit. Uh, we will start back uh, with our federal agency and liaison member updates at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you for joining us for our June and back meeting. We are coming back for our federal agency and liaison member updates. We're going to start with our federal members. Uh, our first uh, federal member is the BARDA presentation from Kim Armstrong. Hi, good afternoon. So happy to be here today. Um, a couple of highlights from our submitted report um, that have occurred over the last few months is to give an update on Project NextGen. So Project NextGen is a $5 billion whole of government approach to developing next generation COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics that is based in HHS and led by ASPR and NIH. Project NextGen will focus on three program areas meant to de-risk products and clinical trials and generate data that supports additional investments and support commercialization. So number one, we want to advance next generation COVID-19 vaccine candidates, including mucosal vaccines, pan-coronavirus vaccines, and vaccines that elicit broader and more durable protection against variants of concern. We want to progress these candidates into clinical trials to determine if they are safe and effective against SARS-CoV-2, infection, severe disease, and death. Area number two will support the advanced development of improved monoclonal antibodies to enable access of an effective product to our most vulnerable populations, such as the immune compromised population. And area number three is to advance development of innovative new vaccine approaches, therapeutic platforms, and manufacturing strategies to enable faster, cheaper, faster and cheaper production and improve efficacy and access. BARDA has recently opened new areas of interest in our broad agency announcement and easy BAA seeking proposals for the development of these next generation COVID-19 therapeutics vaccines and immune assays. So um, a second highlight is on the influenza front. So BARDA continues its work to be prepared for a potential influenza pandemic in light of the high amount of avian influenza circulating globally, including in North and South America. So BARDA is sponsoring um, a secure sponsored phase two uh, clinical trial, which is randomized observer blind, and it will evaluate different priming and booster regimens with MF59 adjuvanted H5N8 and H5N6 cell culture derived influenza vaccines. And we are super excited that this study should begin this summer. In addition, BARDA is supporting GSK in a, a phase one, two observer blind randomized multi-center trial to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of different formulations of monovalent influenza A astrakhan virus vaccine with ASO3 adjuvant system. And again, this study is also scheduled to start this summer. And both of these vaccines um, are really highly matched to what we're actually seeing circulating in the birds um, in North America, which is fantastic news. So in addition to our ongoing support of currently approved recombinant protein cell and egg-based uh, influenza vaccines, BARDA is continuing to support development of additional platforms that may further accelerate the response to a pandemic, such as mRNA. We are pleased to announce that in partnership with the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense, we have partnered with Access to Advanced Health Institute and AstraZeneca to develop pandemic influenza RNA vaccine candidates. And that's my update for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, CDC has a written update that's been distributed to the, uh, the members. Uh, our next presentation will be from DOD. David Hernser. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. I would like to publicly thank NVAC for uh, all the hard work that y'all do, because DOD healthcare reaps all that benefit because of the the services that we're able to provide to our beneficiaries, which are about over 9 million people. Uh, 
some of those wear uniforms and have different situations that they have to deal with, like we mandate that they get a particular vaccine, or they get vaccines that most normal uh, civilians do not get, and we appreciate y'all's involvement in that, as we do ASIP and all other organizations that give us guidance on how best we can provide for those beneficiaries. We still have 400 immunization sites. We gave a lot of COVID vaccine, and we look forward to continuing to provide that service to our beneficiaries, as do we with MPOX. Uh, we're coming around to making sure that the, the, the second dose and, and is available, which it is, and we're very appreciative of that. I know in the past we had to rely on public health departments in some situations. Uh, the directive is that every one of those 400 immunization sites will have a supply of vaccines to give. And then finally, you know, we, we give regular northern hemisphere influenza, but we also give southern hemisphere influenza vaccine. And we, we have to provide that to our um, deploying forces that go to, to the south during the correct season. And all of that is written in my report. So again, thank you for the opportunity to re represent DOD at this, this group. Thank you very much. Uh, next is from FDA, uh, Jay Slater. Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? You're loud and clear, sir. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for for uh, allowing me to represent FDA here today. Uh, um, uh, the activity since the last NVAC meeting uh, is uh, as follows. On February 28th, there was a VERPAC meeting uh, to discuss and make recommendations regarding the safety and effectiveness of Abrisvo the RSV vaccine manufactured by Pfizer for active immunization for adults, um, uh, 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 acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in adults 60 years of age and older. And the next day on March 1st, uh, Verpac had a meeting to discuss Orexv, the uh, RSV vaccine manufactured by GSK for active immunization for the prevention of lower respiratory disease caused by RSV subtypes A and B in uh, individuals 60 years of age and older. Uh, and no, in spite of my voice, I, I don't have RSV to my knowledge. Um, uh, on March 14th, uh, the emergency use authorization for Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 bivalent vaccine to provide for a single booster dose uh, for children six months of age through four years, uh, at least two months after the completion of the primary vaccination series with three doses of monovalent. On April 18th, uh, emergency use authorization uh, was given to the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine bivalent and the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 uh, vaccine bivalent. Uh, for all doses uh, uh, in, for individuals six months of age and older. And this action simplifies the vaccination schedule for most individuals. On April 27th, in collaboration with BARDA, FDA conducted a workshop on recombinant protein-based COVID-19 vaccines. <clears throat> the goal of the workshop, the goals of the workshop were to provide a forum uh, for product sponsors to discuss progress and technical challenges, and an open forum for collaborative discussions to facilitate advancement. Uh, also on April 27th, uh, FDA approved Prevnar 20 for the following indications and in use for the prevention of invasive disease caused by the 20 different serotypes uh, <clears throat> in the vaccine, for individuals six weeks through 17 years of age, and for the prevention of otitis media uh, caused by seven of the serotypes in children six weeks through five years of age. Uh, Prevnar 20 was initially approved by FDA in 2021 uh, for the prevention of pneumonia <clears throat> and invasive disease caused by the 20 different strep pneumo serotypes contained in the vaccine for individuals 18 years of age and older. The next day on April 28th, FDA authorized 
the following uses for the Pfizer-BioNTech bivalent vaccine for individuals six months of age through four years uh, with certain types of immunocompromise who have previously received three 0.2 ml doses of either the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine or the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine bivalent. And those would be a fourth dose administered at least a month after the most recent dose and additional doses that may be administered at the discretion of the healthcare provider, taking into consideration the individual clinical circumstances. On May 3rd, FDA approved Orexvi, the first RSV vaccine approved for use in the United States. Orexvi is approved for prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older. On May 22nd, on 22nd uh, Janssen BioNTech, Biotech requested the voluntary withdrawal of the emergency use authorization uh, for their COVID-19 vaccine. Janssen Biotech informed the FDA that the last lots of the vaccine purchased by the U.S. government have expired. There is no demand for new lots of the vaccine in the United States, and they do not intend to update the strain composition of this vaccine for emerging variants. On June 1st, the FDA revoked the EUA for this vaccine. May 31st, FDA approved Abrisfo, the second RSV vaccine approved for use in the United States, approved for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older. And finally, today, June 15th, uh, the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee is meeting to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the 23-24 COVID-19 vaccines for use in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jay. We look forward to that report out from, uh, from the FDA meeting today. Yes. Our next presentation is from CMS, Mary Beth Hans. Thank you very much. I have a couple of very brief updates. The first is just a little teaser because we will be talking very shortly about the Inflation Reduction Act and the impact um, of the adult vaccine provisions for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, specific to Medicaid, I did want to mention that we continue to um, amplify and look for all, um, opportunities to emphasize the importance of routine pediatric immunizations. One way that we've done this is through our Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign, which provides materials that can be used or rebranded to outreach grantees and a variety of partners that include government agencies, community organizations, healthcare providers, schools, et cetera. Um, we have many tools available related to vac vaccines, um, and many of them can be rebranded um, and you know, have different levels of media tools. Um, in addition, we're hosting a back-to-school webinar through the Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign on June 21st um, that will emphasize the importance of immunizations as well as other preventive services like well-child visits, um, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is HRSA, Roxana Deba. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. I'm going to make my presentation very brief. I just wanted to say it's been a double pleasure listening to all the speakers today because I'm, in addition to my professional responsibilities as a medical review officer for the uh, vaccine injury compensation program, I'm still a practicing physician on the side, and I do weekend uh, shifts. So I was really amazed by by the uh, breadth of the talks uh, that I heard today. So thank you. Uh, just very briefly, the Advisory Commission on Childhood Vaccines, they met in March twice and they discussed the RSV and dengue vaccines. They're still uh, accepting nominations, especially uh, in the DICP. We are looking for a uh, attorney who, an attorney who's interested in vaccine related issues. And there's a website if anyone's interested. Uh, in the vaccine compensation injury front, uh, the, the VICP continues to process 
claims and, and assertively chisel away at the backlog. And the countermeasure um, injury compensation program is receiving uh, a lot of claims. As of April 1st, uh, there is about 11,500 claims approximately, and they're, they're processing those and more claims are becoming eligible for compensation. And, uh, the Bureau of Primary Health Care is, is, is amazing and, and they have a very detailed, um, update, but it seems as of May 5th, they have provided almost 23 and a half million, uh, vaccine doses of COVID-19. And that's the conclusion of my summary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Indian Health Service, Uso Chukuma. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? You're loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present the Indian Health Service update since the last NVAC meeting. Uh, we did submit um, a written response, but I wanted to just highlight a few things. Um, the Indian Health Service continues to prioritize access, uh, quality, and equity in vaccine distribution and administration for American Indian and Alaska Native tribal communities that are served by the IHS uh, health system, system of care. And to date, uh, participating federal tribal and urban facilities within the Indian Health Service jurisdiction has administered over 2.3 million COVID vaccine and continues to push the envelope in, uh, in administering those vaccines. Following the end of the public health emergency uh, in May 2023 and the transition towards commercialization, the um, Indian Health Service Vaccine Task Force has been working to ensure um, federal and tribal and urban facilities within uh, the IHS jurisdiction and able to continue the administration of COVID vaccine alongside other key routine immunizations. Switching over to uh, MPOX, throughout the MPOX public health emergency, um, the Indian Health Service took a proactive approach to the distribution and administration of generic vaccine among uh, high-risk uh, persons in tribal communities. Recognizing the potential for exposure and illness within our service population, the Indian Health Service was among the first of the jurisdictions to expand access to generic vaccine as a pre-exposure prophylaxis as part of our MPOX um, PrEP initiative, which was implemented broadly across our healthcare system. Multiple IHS um, area and facilities have also implemented an equity pilot project to enhance vaccine access for our most vulnerable uh, patients. We also conduct routine surveillance for influenza-like illness and uh, influenza vaccination coverage through our IHS influenza awareness system. Uh, the 2022-2023 influenza season shows uh, quite a high um, ILI activity compared to the 21-22 season. The ILI activity showed um, a LE rapid increase that peaked at week 50 and subsequently uh, a downward uh, trend, uh, a steep decline. The ILI activity documented between weeks 40 and through weeks 52 is more elevated than the previous six influenza seasons that has been captured by our system. The system also indicates that the IHS regions with very high influenza vaccination coverage rates reported lower um, ILI activity within their regions as compared to those with low vaccination coverage rates. The IHS immunization program continues to collaborate with our federal and tribal partners to pro uh, promote annual flu shots alongside all recommended vaccines across, across the lifespan. And then finally, uh, late last year in 2022, the IHS announced a new national vaccine strategy to promote enhanced vaccination coverage among patients across the age spectrum. The E3 vaccine initiative is designed to promote access to every patient, to every encounter, to every recommended vaccine when clinically indicated. This includes all ACIP recommended vaccines in all age groups. We are working with, we are collaborating with key stakeholders, especially tribal communities, and seek to leverage the lessons learned from the COVID vaccine campaign to improve general vaccination rates in our service population. 
This year, the IHS is focusing its efforts on operationalizing that uh, the E3 initiative using a bottom-up approach uh, and sharing lessons learned via, via the E3 vaccine initiative and the National Immunization Program. The efforts around this initiative includes extensive uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, collaboration, uh, quality improvement cycles to test small changes to existing systems and processes, encouraging innovation within our facility and sites, embracing failure as a, change, as a part of change and incentivizing efforts towards success using best practices developed within Indian country. We look forward to continued collaboration with our tribal, urban and uh, federal partners to ensure access to safe and effective vaccines across, across the age spectrum for American Indian and Alaskan natives served by the Indian Health Service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and our final federal agency uh, report is NIH, uh, and the NIH uh, written report has been distributed to the uh, committee members. We'll now turn to our liaison uh, committee members, and we'll start with Verpak Hana Al Sali. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Very good. <clears throat> Today I will be going over uh, the VERPAC uh, meeting and uh, its proceedings since uh, our last meeting in February. Dr. Jay Slater actually touched upon a lot of what took place, um, and it's provided in written format for you to review. On February 28th, uh, under topic one, the committee met to discuss the safety and effectiveness of Abrisfo, which is the RSV vaccine manufactured by Pfizer for the indication prevention of lower respiratory tract infection uh, disease in uh, an individual 60 years of age or older. The committee reviewed the data. Uh, it voted seven yes, four no, and one abstention on the two questions, uh, safety and efficacy of the product uh, in, uh, for the indication. On May 31st, the May uh, 2023, the BLA was approved uh, for the above indication with post-marketing requirement for phar pharmacovigilance studies, evaluating the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome among 1.5 million vaccine recipients, a commitment for active surveillance for atrial fibrillation and final study, study analysis. On March 1st, 2023, under topic two, the committee met in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of RXV, which is the RSV vaccine recombinant and adjuvanted as manufactured by GSK for the indication uh, of prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV A and B subtypes in adults 60 years of age and older. Verpac voted 12 yes, zero no for efficacy, 10 yes, and two no for safety. On May the 3rd, the BLA was approved for the above indication with a requirement for post-marketing pharmacovigilance plans uh, for uh, evaluation of the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome among vaccine recipients. On May 7th, the committee met an open session to discuss uh, the selection of the influenza vaccine strain to be in, strains to be included in the vaccine, the seasonal vaccine for the 2023-2024 influenza season. The vote was 13 yes and zero no for the inclusion of the a Victoria uh, uh, for the egg-based vaccine, that's pandemic O9, H1N1 like, the Wisconsin, also H1N1 pandemic O9 like for the recombinant and cell-based vaccines, the Darwin uh, like va uh, virus for the H3 and 2 like virus, and the Austria for the uh, B Victoria lineage uh, virus. The vote on the inclusion of the B Fuquet, which is of the Yamagata lineage, uh, as the fourth strain in the vaccine, um, had a vote that was split seven yes, two no, and four abstentions. On May the 18th, the committee met in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of Abrisvo, which is the RSV vaccine manufactured by Pfizer, 
for the requested indication of prevention of lower respiratory tract disease in infants and severe lower respiratory tract disease in infants caused by RSV from birth through six months of age via active immunizations of the pregnant mothers. The committee voted 14 yes um, and uh, zero uh, no regarding the efficacy of the product. Uh, and 10 yes, 4 no regarding the safety of the product. The FDA decision was not issued yet. And as we are speaking, uh, the VERPAC is convening now. I'm recused uh, to discuss and make recommendations on the selections of the strains to be included in the periodic updated COVID-19 vaccines for 2023-2024 vaccination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is ACCV. Uh, Roxana, you're back up. Thank you. I, I might have jumped the gun earlier. As I, I've already mentioned, they met in March uh, twice virtually and discussed the dengue and RSV vaccines. Thank you. Roxana, I think I made a typo on that. Um, do you have any other HRSA updates? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is AIM. Uh, Claire Hannon, are you on? I am on. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hopkins. Uh, I did, AIM did submit a written report. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few things here. We recently concluded our vaccine access cooperative um, regional meetings. We held 10 in-person regional meetings, identifying and addressing challenges to pediatric COVID vaccination. We invited critical partners such as AAP and pharmacies and Medicaid, and we had jurisdictions from each region um, in the room. And I'm gonna highlight some of the themes that we learned tomorrow during our panel discussion. Um, we held this past spring 10 focus groups on commercialization of COVID, and we're now working on successful implementation of the BRIDGE program to provide COVID vaccine for uninsured adults once um, COVID vaccine goes to the commercial market. Uh, we've been very active um, with our Adult Immunization Committee. We participated with the National Adult and Influenza Immunization Summit um, on a panel looking at the environment and challenges of transitioning COVID vaccination programs um, into routine adult activities. And so we're gonna continue to work with CDC on framework and guidance for that transition and hopefully to build robust um, adult immunization activities at the state and jurisdictional level. And then finally, I wanted to highlight our AIM Immunization Champion Award. We provide an opportunity for each jurisdiction to recognize and honor an individual who is working to increase vaccine coverage levels and jurisdictions are submitting their champion nominations right now in June, and we will announce and honor the champion award uh, winners in August in celebration of the National Immunization Awareness, Awareness Month. If anyone is interested in the nomination process, check your state with your state immunization program, your jurisdiction immunization program, or you can contact AIM. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Our next presentation is from ARA, County Londo. Good afternoon. I'm Courtney Londo, representing the American Immunization Registry Association, or ARA, and I'm pleased to be with you to provide an update. In December, ARA published guidance on messaging sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI, in response to proposed legislation and jurisdictions. ERA commissioned a small working group to prepare a technical guidance document to support IAS that are sending or receiving SOGI information. And this guidance will support the immunization community in leveraging IAS data to further understand and address health disparities. Next, I have an update on the Recover EHR Immunization Linkage Project. The purpose of this project is to link immunization registry data, which is collected through state and local vaccine registries, to electronic health records not already shared within the EHR. 
These linkages will enable scientific studies that evaluate the impact of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines on long-term outcomes of COVID-19 illness. Within the last six months, a linkage between the Colorado Registry and Colorado Children's Hospital was successful, and we've shared some exciting data on this project within our written report. Next, we know that large provider organizations and health payers would benefit from a standardized way to access large amounts of IIS data for their patients and members. During the pandemic, many individuals accessed vaccines outside of their regular healthcare setting, such as a mass vaccination clinic, and the individual's provider may not have received all of their patients', patients vaccination records into their EHR. So partners, including CDC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, or ONC, HIMSS, and many different EHR representatives are currently developing bulk query as an emerging standard for how to access large amounts of data. AIR is in the process of drafting the guidance and best practices for how to conduct standardized bulk query and look forward to making this available in the coming months. And in our report, we list several provider perspectives on bulk query. Finally, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the ongoing need to share participant clinical trial data with appropriate entities, um, particularly primary care providers. IAS can capture and include investigational study vaccines, including COVID-19, in participants' comprehensive vaccination records and links to ERA resources on considerations for capturing this type of data, along with several other timely updates can be found in our written report. So thank you for giving us the time to provide an update. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Next is, is Asto, Kim Martin. Hi, great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present on behalf of Asto. Um, like other organizations, we do have a full report in your packet, but I will just take a minute to highlight some of our activities. Um, first, we continue to support our members, the state and territorial health officials, by providing situational awareness and technical assistance. We have developed several new resources, which can be found on our website, including recent daily podcasts, blogs, and legislative updates. I encourage you to check it out when you have time. Um, second, we continue to work in coordination with ONC on our ideas project or the Immunization Data Exchange Advancement and Sharing Program. This project aims to support a learning community to advance data sharing between the IIS and HIEs. We recently released two reports. The first one characterizes the dynamics influencing IIS and HIE partnerships and data exchange. And the second report is a legal landscape of public health data sharing. Both reports are available on our website. Next, um, I wanted to mention um, as part of our CDC Partnering for Vaccine Equity Program, we are working with the National Community Action Partnership, five community action agencies, and a network, network of partners um, to use locally tailored evidence-based strategies to increase vaccine acceptance and uptake among racial and ethnic minority populations. We have uh, posted various blogs about some of our lessons learned from this project, and we are currently working to develop a vaccine equity toolkit um, for community leaders and providers. And finally, uh, I wanted to mention a project that we are doing in coordination with Harvard Opinion Research Program, NIFIC, and CDC to strengthen communication and messaging. The goal of this project is to support public health agencies with actionable data that can be used to enhance communication efforts. So in coordination with our partners, we have fielded several public opinion surveys to provide health agencies with time-sensitive data on perspectives from the public related to COVID and vaccination. And there are various resources about our findings from this project on our website and also a recent article in Health Affairs. Thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Kim. Our next presentation is for NACHO, Matt Bobo. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, we also have a written report, um, but I will go over some highlights. 
Um, so with the end of the National Public Health Emergency Declaration on May 11th, NHO has de-escalated from our incident command team um, and as such has discontinued its weekly COVID-19 digest. On April 24th through the 27th, NHO held the 2023 Preparedness Summit in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, the theme of the conference this year was recover, renew, reprioritizing all hazards preparedness. On July 10th through the 13th of this year, um, NHO will be hosting its annual NHO 360 conference. It will be in Denver, Colorado. This year's theme is elevating public health practice from today and tomorrow. In terms of some per project updates, um, throughout January and February, NHO conducted its national survey of local health departments immunization programs. Um, we'll use these findings to identify best practices and organizational challenges. NHO continues to convene its Immunization Workgroup Advisory Committee comprised of local health officials, programmatic local health department staff, and immunization coalition members. NHO continues to participate um, in the Equipping Local Health Departments to Address Vaccine Hesitancy Project. As part of that project, local health departments completed rapid community assessments and created work plans. Um, you can view those in our reports with some blog posts. Um, a third cohort of sites have completed their rapid community assessment trainings and conducted RCAs in their communities. Um, they'll be presenting their findings at Nature 360 in July. Um, through the Partnering for Vaccine Equity Project, aim, NHO aims to increase local health departments' capacity to improve adult vaccination coverage by identifying strategies um, to reduce racial and ethnic disparities. Um, and then for the PAVE project, we do have a request for applications. It was released on May 22nd, so we have another round of those. Um, and then finally, through the Equipping Local Health Departments to Build COVID-19 Vaccine Confidence Project, um, on February 27th, uh, the Public Health Foundation held a strategic uh, communications project um, workshop for the development of actionable strategies to improve vaccinations in local health department communities. Um, and then we've also taken the opportunity to do site visits at some of our funded local health departments to learn best practices. Um, and then the rest of the information you can find in the written report. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, next is the Public Health Agency of Canada, Erin Henry. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for, uh, for having me. And it has been a wonderful day full of presentations. Um, firstly, Canada's National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, so your ACIP equivalent, recently released interim guidance on the use of bivalent Omicron-containing COVID-19 vaccines for primary series, so we released that last week. NACI now recommends that when an mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are used for the primary series, bivalent Omicron-containing vaccines can be used in individuals six months of age and over. This is currently an off-label recommendation here in Canada, as these products are only approved for use as a booster. Um, I also wanted to highlight that back in April, NACI released the first edition of guidelines for the economic evaluation of vaccine programs in Canada, which uh, marked a major milestone for the committee, as this work has been ongoing since 2018, although we were a little busy over um, the pandemic. Um, the guidelines were established to articulate best practices for conducting and reporting economic evaluations of vaccination programs in Canada, looking ahead to the future as part of efforts to resume our non-COVID-19 related activities. Uh, NACI's work plan will include work to address various policy and program issues around items including MPOX, seasonal influenza, HPV, RSV, rabies, hepatitis A, herpes zoster, um, invasive meningococcal disease, and hepatitis B. Much of this work is already underway in um, via NACI's various working groups, and NACI is also planning on releasing um, in mid-July our fall guidance for our COVID-19 uh, vaccine programming. Uh, next, I'd like to quickly highlight the Immunization Partnership Fund, um, which was developed in 2016 with the goal of increasing vaccination coverage in Canada. 
The IPF is an equity and evidence-based program and the only one of its kind in Canada that funds projects which promote education and awareness regarding the importance of vaccination. Most recently, the program demonstrated clear results with its COVID-19 specific investments, which totaled um, approximately $81.5 million. Uh, for this year, the IPF will invest a further $10 million in time-limited uh, projects that continue um, these efforts this fall and winter for our COVID-19 um, vaccination campaign, but also for our flu campaign. And lastly, recognizing that out-of-date web content uh, risks undermining public trust. Um, FAC has begun updating vaccination web content that we've ignored the last three years and uh, vaccine preventable disease web pages on the Government of Canada's website. So we have a much more fulsome written report, uh, but that was just a few highlights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Next, the American Pharmacists Association, Kelly Good. Hi, thanks, Bob. I just have a few highlights um, from our written report. Um, first, just a reminder that the American Pharmacists Association is the largest pharmacy organization representing more than 62,000 members. The organization continues to be involved um, with vaccinations for our members around um, three key areas, engagement, training and education, and information and resources. Um, this is all in the written report. There's a couple of things I do want to um, point out, and that is that APHA just released a Superheroes of COVID-19 vaccination coloring book that can be downloaded, and the link is available in the written report if you'd like to download that to convey the importance of COVID-19 vaccines and prevention for pediatric patients. Second, under information and resources, as the PREP Act begins to expire and some of the authority for pharmacists across the U.S. Um, changes based on um, state laws, there's an update to pharmacist authority around vaccinations um, that has been updated that you can find as well. So that's also that link is available in the written update. And lastly, I just want to um, share that this will be my last meeting as the liaison member for the American Pharmacists Association. I really would like to thank HHS and Aiken and her team, the NVAC committee, Bob Hopkins for his leadership. The past six years have been an incredible opportunity and experience, and I really appreciate the recognition of the role and contributions of pharmacists to protecting the nation against vaccine preventable diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kelly. It's been a pleasure having you as part of our August group, and I'm sure we'll keep Mitch busy after you. Yeah, great yeah. welcome, Mitch. Yes. And our final presentation is for mm -hmm. okay. from AHRQ, uh, Sheena Harris. Good afternoon. I'll be sharing a brief update on the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's rele relevant activities. The United States Preventive Services Task Force has an ongoing review and update of its 2018 recommendation on cervical cancer screening. The current recommendation is an A recommendation for women aged 21 to 65 and a D recommendation for the following groups, women less than 21 years or above 65 years of age and persons who've had a hysterectomy. The current research plan, which was finalized in March of 2022, includes key questions which examine the role of HPV vaccine and cancer screening strategies, as well as the accuracy of self-collected samples. And a draft recommendation statement is expected in early 2024. Um, in addition, our written report includes two other ARC-funded projects, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, thank you for an excellent day of presentations and discussions, and that's all I have. Thank you very much, Sheena. Our final panel for the day is uh, Inflation Reduction Act Changes to Medicaid and Medicare. Christina Martin from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and Mary Beth Hans from CMS uh, will discuss changes for recommended vaccines in Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. And uh, we appreciate their uh, presentation and bringing us up to date. Give us just a moment for them to get to the podium. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I think 
I might be your, we might be like keeping you guys from enjoying the beautiful weather outside. I just want to say thank you so much for inviting CMS to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the really, the provisions that we think are going to really be helpful for folks um, in terms of accessing um, their vaccinations and just making sure that they can afford them at a low cost as well as um, reminding them of how important vaccinations are. Um, so just as a quick overview, the president signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act, which included a lot of different provisions, some health provisions, um, in August of 2022. Um, we really hit the ground running on implementation. Our, it was signed into law in August. Our first implementation date was October 1st, uh, just a, less than two months later. Um, and one of our earliest implementations was on the vaccine provision. This kind of lays out just an overview of all the health provisions that were in the Inflation Reduction Act. As you can see, a lot of them were Medicare related, um, but we also have an expansion of the Affordable Care Act marketplace subsidies, and then also the Medicaid and CHIP expansion of Medicaid, vaccine, and vaccine access as well that Mary Beth will be speaking to. And the goal of the law was really to help reduce healthcare costs and drug costs for families and individuals, as well as for taxpayers. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the new Medicare Part D vaccine provision. It was one of the first provisions, as I mentioned, that went into effect with the new law, and it went into effect on January 1st, 2023. It requires all Medicare Part D plans to cover ACIP recommended adult vaccines without any cost sharing. This means that deductibles do not apply, and there's no cost sharing for any, the, any of the fees also associated with administering the vaccine, including a dispensing fee or administration fee. So it really does truly make the vaccines that are available in Part D available free at cost for uh, people with Medicare prescription drug coverage. It also makes it more similar to the provisions that are already existing in Part, Medicare Part B for vaccines, which are already available without cost sharing, and the commercial plans, which was done by the Affordable Care Act. And to dive a little bit deeper, um, the provision covers all ACIP recommended adult vaccinations. And when there is a new vaccine recommended by ACIP, Part D plans are required to cover those without cost sharing um, at the time that they are recommended. And so we've released several guidances in advance of implementation of this provision, as well as some that have followed on to make sure that we are providing appropriate clarifications uh, to ensure successful implementation. And just to note, some of those guidances included quite a bit of policy about, you know, which vaccines should the no cost sharing apply to, um, what populations, how to think about them, um, also like financially how to support the operations of it adjudicating the claim with no cost sharing associated. But we also issue guidance on how to communicate uh, to beneficiaries who have prescription drug coverage, so how plans should be including it in their plan materials uh, so that beneficiaries knew that these uh, vaccines were free to them um, as part of their Medicare Part D plan. And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of what we're doing now. Um, you know, all Part D plans are in compliance, um, and these vaccines are available. Our colleagues um, in the HHS Assistant Secretary for Policy and Evaluation have put out some reports about, you know, what does this mean in terms of savings for folks. But CMS is really focusing on trying to get the word out and trying to make sure that people know that these vaccines are now free to them. Um, so we created a social media toolkit, one in Spanish and one in English, and have been working with our other interested stakeholders to get the word out and to really message. And so, you know, we have those available on our website for people to download and use those materials. Um, we've also, just last month, launched a new digital campaign targeting people with Medicare Part D uh, to let them know that these vaccines are now free um, to them through their Medicare prescription drug coverage plan. Um, we've also been including more information. We have some fact sheets, you know, for that are beneficiary focused that we've been distributing to pharmacists and other providers who work closely with Medicare beneficiaries for, you know, so that they know that these, these provisions are available to them and they can take advantage of them. And then finally, just a quick in summary, you know, as I mentioned, the law was really meant to help expand access and improve costs for people with Medicare and prescription drugs. 
Um, you know, we think that this is going to be a meaningful benefit for millions of people with Medicare. We're really excited about it. And we know that people have been really excited as well. We've talked to manufacturers of vaccines who are very excited to be promoting. And some of you might have even noticed. <laughs> um, I noticed when I go to visit my mom, who's on Medicare, um, some of the commercials on Hulu <laughs> are talking about zero dollar vaccines for people with Medicare. Um, and so, you know, I think now, in, in the long run, this is going to be hugely successful provision, um, making the vaccines more affordable, but also sustainability of Medicare because we know how important vaccines are into keeping people healthy. And so we, we're really excited that this is going to be real savings and excited about other provisions that we're also implementing in the Inflation Reduction Act. And now that we have policies that are starting to align on the vaccines um, for folks, it's, you know, an exciting opportunity for us to really promote public health. And th I'm Mary Beth Hans, and I am going to talk about the Medicaid provisions. We're in a slightly different place because our provision hasn't become effective yet. We have um, guidance that is really close to getting out. So I am talking without slides because we're just not quite in the same place. So I'm going to give a very high level overview. And then as soon as this guidance gets out, we'll make sure that we get it to everyone. So um, beginning in October 2023, the Inflation Reduction Act will expand coverage of ACIP-recommended adult vaccines without cost sharing to me under Medicaid and CHIP, and it will mandate coverage for enrollees who receive coverage under traditional Medicaid, all medically, med Medicaid medically necessary, medically needy, sorry, enrollees in specified states, and CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program, enrollees 19 years of age or older. And as I just said, we will be issuing guidance in the future. Um, I'm sure that you all are aware that prior to this, we did not have across the board coverage for adults in Medicaid. Um, primarily the, the traditional adults did not have it. We know that um, most states offered coverage of some adult vaccines, but they also had the option to um, impose cost sharing. So we're very excited about this provision. And um, again, we're working very hard on guidance and looking forward to the implementation. Um, there is a, a slight fiscal impact for states for doing this, states that were um, covering as of the date of enactment of the IRA, which was um, August 16th, 2022. If a state had um, covered all ACIP recommended vaccines were co without cost sharing, they will receive a 1% percentage point increase in the federal matching rate, which is the, the money that we give to states. You know, if Medicaid is a federal state partnership program. Um, for their Medicaid expenditures for these vaccination services for the first eight fiscal quarters that began on or after October 1st. Um, and just since we're all aware of all the different vaccine provisions, just to mention that this does overlap with the American Rescue um, Plan Act of 2021 that requires states to cover COVID-19 vaccines in their administration without cost sharing until September 30th, 2024. So thank you again, and we're really looking forward to the implementation of this provision. Thank you both very much. Do there any, are there any questions or comments from uh, those either on the line? Molly, help. So I know enough about Medicare and vaccines just to be dangerous, so I'm sorry if this is a really obvious question, but skilled nursing facilities and vaccines. Who can bill for vaccines administered in a skilled nursing facility? And I guess I'm thinking of, there. I know there were changes during the emergency and now that's reverting back, my understanding, in July. But then in the future with, you know, potentially everyone 60 or 65 and older needing RSV vaccine this fall, thinking about planning for who can go into the long-term care and administer that vaccine and be able to bill for it. And then I have a second question around, I'm hearing from providers, you know, we've been wanting to promote the availability of vaccines um, at no cost for 65 and older, but a lot of our local health departments are not getting covered their full cost. They're losing money, especially on the Zoster vaccine. And so just curious as to how those, co 
costs are determined or the reimbursement and if if that will be increased to make sure everyone's receiving adequate reimbursement. Okay, yeah, all right. Um, Molly, great first question. Um, as you can imagine, we have extensive FAQs on, co on pandemic unwinding. So I would have to go back and double check our FAQs on the specific for the skilled nursing facility, but I can share the FAQ with Ann and like get it back to you guys. I'm sure there's an FAQ on that. I feel like there's like 40 pages of FAQs uh, to prepare people for the unwinding. And so happy to get back to you guys on that one. On the second one, you know, I'd be curious about, you know, kind of hearing more about the experiences of the community health centers and the, cl and the clinics about, you know, what the, what the issues are. I think that, you know, there has been a lot of conversation. You know, I think this is part of why we got to addressing drug costs in, with the Inflation Reduction Act about, you know, reimbursement and making sure it's adequate so that people could get access to drugs. Um, but also to really think about, you know, what's the cost of drugs overall for our system. And so I'm happy if you want to connect me with some folks, I'm happy to talk to them about their experiences and see if there's anything, you know, that we should be doing to address those. I do not see any more questions or comments here in the room. Let me look at the uh, chat just a moment. None online. So thank you both very much for your presentation. Uh, and. Uh, we appreciate your, your update. This is important for our patients. Uh, at this time, uh, we are we're prepared for public comment, but I understand we do not have anyone online for public comment today. Uh, if there are any written comments, and we'll distribute those to uh, members of the committee. And uh, with no public comment, we will adjourn uh, for our first day of our June meeting. We will uh, resume the meeting tomorrow morning uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. I want to thank those of you that participated in our, uh, our first day of our June uh, NVAC meeting and look forward to tomorrow's presentations. Uh, and uh, you'll have a good evening. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.